the whole idea behind the first preseason meeting, I thought this was something that we set up from the very beginning, kind of help out first time coaches as well as gauge things. And at the end, we'll talk about future sessions and ideas for the, the webinar series. So the first thing I'll do is kind of kind of ask a question now. Why is this so important? So what do you think as, as far as, I want you guys to think back for a second, back in the first years of school, that first day you walked in your classroom, that very first time that that teacher introduced themselves to you. And I want you to kind of to think of that way. These people, when you walk in, they're not going to know anything about you. Chances are you may be the poor person that got stuck coaching uh, the team because if you didn't, then, the, then they would take the team away or wouldn't let you guys play. Or it may be this is something that's been your passion from the very beginning. But from your very first time you start off and how you set the tone for the rest of the year, this becomes critical. You know, we used to have back in the days when I was teaching, there was that three month rule where you wouldn't smile till the time you had it. But with that being said, with that three months, we can't do that anymore. This first time we're going to interact is going to be unbelievably important how they gauge it. So here's what I want to do. We're going to try this thing out. And since our first round, this has been effective in past webinars. But I'm going to go ahead and put you guys into a, a breakout room. And what that is, is I want you to start off with introducing yourselves. And at the same time, if you'll do me a favor and also come up with the things that you guys think is important in this first round. Let's see, we're going to go, if there's 19 of us, we'll go ahead and create six breakout rooms. That should give us three to a person. All right, Darren, when you're in your group, was there anything you guys came up with? There's anybody else like to share it if you'll unmute for just a second? Uh, me and Saul were just talking about um, how to handle parents. Um, that's kind of a challenging thing. Gotcha. And I want you to remember that as we go through, but I agree with you 100%. So both of y'all, how long have you coached for, Darren? Uh, I'd say probably 11 years. Okay. Yeah, so you can't coach 11 years and not have some kind of parental issues, huh? <laughs> that kind of goes with Sal. How about you? You know, I'm a first timer, so I'm, I'm. This is this is definitely helping me out on the prep side before I even get to to coaching a team. So I, I've yet, you know, to get started on on the journey. Fair enough. So, what about you, Mario? What do you have? Uh, I've been coaching for seven years now. Okay. So, what are your thoughts? What things do you think should be included? Um. Well, I don't. I think we got lost there for a second. Um, but I think you know, very open communication. It's it's the key to everything, and uh, you kind of set up your standards from the very beginning for the parents and for the kids. So um, what I always do at the beginning of every season is just kind of do like a checklist of things that I I want to work, and I'm going to be working with the kids and um, things that I always do during practice and activities that we do outside the fields as a, as a team. So um, I always create, create a list and talk to parents and kids at the same time uh, about these ideas so that definitely helps. Gotcha. And so part of the idea behind the way we're going to run this one now on other webinars will be uh, presented by different people, but whenever I get on, I want to bring in your experience because when we look across the board here from the, the brand new coach to the one that's done seven, 11 years, like Mario and Darren, there's a wealth of opportunity and knowledge within our, our coaching community that we can use to, to back it up. But part of the idea of getting you guys to start talking is to start to, to feed off each other and see what it is. Now, I created a checklist as well. If at any point you think that the, at any point in the conversation you want to raise your hand and just pop in and unmute yourself, you're welcome to bring in some other ideas. But here's some of the things that I thought would be important. First thing, obviously, when you come into it, you know, the introduction. When you come out, at any place, this is the first time most of these people will see you. And it's going to be unbelievably important that we set the tone right. Now, suggested that during this time, the kids be playing off the side, have an assistant coach or somebody else running the, the group. If not, do it after practice. But you don't really want the little guys involved in it because it's the first time you're going to introduce yourself to. They're going to want to know who you are, you know, especially with a, a, a brand new parent, because a lot of these parents will maybe the if you're at a, say, for example, the, the 4v4 age group. This may be the first time they ever played the game and they have no idea what's going on or what's happening. It's so really important to explain why you're doing this, right? So if it was the poor, if you're the one person out of all the parents that got picked that had to coach the team, and let me look back on, we had somebody do that. 
Yeah, there you go. So Sal said the same thing. Uh, then maybe there's a reason why you could tell them, say, hey, look, you know, I picked up this team. I'm brand new at this thing, but I'm doing it to support not only my kid, but your kid to make the best possible environment possible. Right. Maybe there's something you want to do for or for a profession, something you want to include into that. But you want to be very honest in the reasoning why you're doing it. Right. You also want to do your coaching and playing background. And I put on there, you know, ego and the reason I put ego on it, you know, it's 100 percent OK to admit that maybe this is the first time you've ever been around the game. You know, it's also OK to admit that maybe you've been a player. Maybe it's the first time you coached and that's OK to, to sell them to as well. I'm a big believer in honesty from the very beginning because they'll see right through it if you haven't. But it also gives you a starting point to, to understanding what's happening. And obviously, personal life, you don't want to get too detailed. But you know, what family, what you have, where you work, you know, what engages you and why you enjoy what you're doing. Now, here's the part where I'm going to open up to you guys. Is there anything you want to add to it, especially from maybe a new perspective or to somebody else? So I'll open up for a second. Mario, look like you're clicking the mute, but maybe you weren't. Oh, you're still muted. Hey, this is Brian. <clears throat> I don't okay, know if Brian. Actual, no name shows up on this or not, but my camera is not working. Um, I think that, so I'm in a younger age group. <clears throat> okay. It maybe gets more competitive, but I, I did this in T-ball. I did my first time doing T-ball, um, you know, five and six, four and five year olds. And I, I think, um, telling the parents what success looks like to you for the for the season so that they understand that your success looks like hey they got better by from the beginning to the end success isn't about how many games we won um how many home runs we hit or goals we scored it's just that we have fun in practice and the games and that they get better each um you know from the time we start practice to the time we end the season especially at least for me, my perspective, I'm talking, you know, five and six year olds that, that is, I don't actually don't even keep score. So nobody does win. So um, them hearing out loud, what, what you believe success looks like, I think is important. <laughs> Man, that's awesome, Brian. I appreciate you bringing that up. That's coming up in a later slide, but you're hundred percent correct. You know, as far as other introduction things, what else does anybody have to add to it? Because Brian is hundred percent right. Because not all of us will have the same definition of success. Not all of us will be at the same place or same time in coaching. Now, obviously, for a professional coach, it wouldn't be the same as a four side player. Yeah, I'll add a little something. Um, nah. this, this is kind of my second time around with a uh, coach. And I, I coach my kids, and now I'm, I'm coaching my, my grandson's team. Um, but I, I think that introduction to the parents, and, and I, I would typically write a parents, and I'll do uh, do this again this year is write a letter to the parents and just explaining what what's you know who am I what's my philosophy uh, but there's you know at, especially at the younger ages where people see a big pack of kids and they, they don't understand that explain them you know well some of my goals is to is is, is to when you see a pack helping the, you understand that they're learning how to play very small ball they're learning how to play in a crowd they're learning those things <laughs> even where things that look like it's not soccer it's teaching soccer. And so just explaining some of that through there and then continually um, keeping the parents apprised on where I see the progress, where they may not see it. Uh, and then that happens at any age. Oh, I love it. No, that's it. Well said, Brent. And so as we progress on the same thing, the next part is, is it's kind of weird. When we go back to my time when I first started coaching, I almost thought the parents were a, a adversarial group. And as I got all along and, and further in my career, I found out that's part of your team. So if the, the team's going bad, it's, it's end up being your fault. If the parents are going crazy, we got to look back on ourselves. So one thing I suggest when you first start that meeting after you introduce yourself, we go back to who the parents are. Because not only are they trying to figure out who you are, they're also trying to figure out the social circle within the parents that they're going to be together. And you're going to, you're going to ask these people for a lot of things and ask them to help each other out and have an environment that's going to grow that actually, you know, if it's done correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's really special when you have a strong parent group together that goes together, travels together. You know, if you'll go on a, on tournament nights and, and anywhere in the state of Texas, you'll find little parent groups that are together. that are having little cookouts for the game. But part of that comes from this best time. And so I suggest that that whenever you bring them in, now get them thinking, kind of like what we're doing here with you guys. 
So I ask them to remember the best time in sports. What was their best memory they had? And give them a little thinking time. Because what you want to do is you want to build, hopefully they had a good experience, obviously, but you want to build that feeling they had when they were playing into what you're going to build as a team. Obviously, this is the part where they're going to hate. You're going to ask them to, to tell their, each other's name. You know, ask them why they feel like their child is playing. You know, how do they think their, their child would answer that question? And then what we're going to do in here in a future slide is I'm going to give you those answers to it. And it's actually kind of telling. And then remind them that after practice, obviously not running in front of everybody, will be kind of a little, a little nervous about this, but ask them for any allergies or medical issues they might have. But this is the kind of information you're going to have to have going into it so you can help their, their child be better. And so as we start going on, who the parents are, have them start interacting with each other and start building it up. And somebody brought this up earlier. You know, what is your coaching and philosophy? You know, what is it you do? So is player development more important than results? And we certainly hope so. And through our coaching education program, we can bring that up too. What's your objective for the season? You know, what do you think it's going to look like? How do you want it to be? How do you measure success? Right now, here's kind of scary because if you walk into a team and say, oh, we're going to win every single game, but you've never seen this team play or who they're playing against, that may not be the best measure to have. Right. So success may be like somebody said, who was it earlier? Was it Mario or can't remember the one was brought up unbelievable point you know you come in and it was a t-ball example so it was brent right but talked about you know what does success look like you know maybe it's not scoring goals maybe it's just improved be able to play a game maybe it's the first time they ever played and say you know hey you know if we can get everybody out there together and and playing and going the same direction and they'll understand that one for five-year-olds then that's success maybe every kid's participating maybe it's to have every single kid to be a part because there'll be some in the first years, especially where the kids won't get on the field. The next thing is that most leagues have a playing time, which is playing 50% of the time. So you're going to have to put this from the very beginning to explain why it's happening, you know, so you can hold yourself accountable as well as those or others around you. And what's expectations for player improvement? What do you want to see them improving? Maybe it's you want to be able to dribble better. Maybe it's connect complete five passes but it's something to that measure. What are you gonna measure success? And then the last thing is, what will practices look like? You know, what times they start, what time they end? You know, hopefully you'll look at some of our coaching education courses where maybe it's play, practice, play, where they're gonna come in and play at the end. Maybe it's a, a simple to complex, but give the parents some idea of how you're gonna do this and what it looks like. Next thing we'll add in is most important thing. So somebody's already brought this up too as well, because you guys are already rock stars. But how will you communicate? What is the, what's the preferred way? Do you want them to be texting you? Is there a time you don't want to be called? After a certain time, kids are going to bed. One at 10 o'clock, we shut down. Would you rather them text you? What app might you use? And so we're going to have, and to plug for the next one, we're going to have the Mojo app, which allows for, for communication. A lot of times in high school, I use Sports U. And it was a neat app that you put the information in. It notified all the parents of all the things that happened. And it was automatic and instant. So all a player or parent have to do is look at the app and it would tell them what the practice times were, locations, you know, change for weather. In fact, it lists weather. And there's tons of apps out there that I'll be happy to share later. Is it an old school phone tree? Are you going to call one parent? They are charged with calling two parents then and vice versa on and on and on until you play the whole team. Is it going to be by text? Are you going to start a text group? And how do they text you and text each other? Right. When do they need to check on cancellation? So a lot of times happens is that, you know, this week, just give you a heads up. I may have to cancel practice because of work or whatever. Maybe you're going to have a manager. You know, we'll identify that later through through the volunteerism. How do you want the players now? Here's the part that's going to be the toughest. Right. A lot of times when when you come in with the parents, little Jimmy scrubs his knee, doesn't say a word. So mom comes up and flames out on you. How do you want them to adjust? What do you expect of the players? Do you want the players to talk to you first and then the parent come in? Or is it something that, that you have a different round of doing it? I would strongly suggest say, okay, if there's a problem within the team, you know, let little Sally come talk to us about it. We'll try to sort it out. And if that's the case, then you haven't got a resolution, then you come and talk to me. So we start teaching them how to self-advocate for themselves. All right. And then the last most important one that I always add into is a 24-hour rule. Here are what happens, and this happens at every single level. A parent's upset about something, maybe, you know, they didn't get 
a half of or three quarters of a game like they thought they should. Maybe after a game they're upset because little Billy, you know, said something. There's going to be that 24 hour rule. Don't don't come and talk to somebody when you're inflamed. So what he always said is that after a match is over with, give yourself 24 hours to relax and then call me and then we'll talk about it. But most things don't happen when you're upset right after a game, right after practice, unless it's an emergency situation. I'm going to pause for a second. Anybody other have anything else they want to add to the communication piece? Mario, do you unmute? Do you have some? Uh, no, I think everything that you've gone through so far, it's, it's great. I wouldn't add anything else. Communication is the key, like you said, uh, through the app. Uh, me personally, I've been using Team Snap for many years, and it has worked great with all the parents. And it's ways than we used to do it when I first started, that's for sure, because we used to do that phone tree thing. We call one parent, and they spread out, and then if uh, little Billy's mom forgot it was her turn to call somebody, then you lost half your communication. It took forever. <laughs> but no, that's true. Anybody else have anything else to add, too? All right, here we go. Let's try the next one. Now, here's the, the most important part of the communication is parent expectations. So just by, I don't think we really show up hands, but practice attendance. Now you'd be surprised how many of y'all actually have issues and throw it in the chat. Now let's do it this way. How many of y'all have parents that show up all the time to every single practice? That's awesome, Mario. You're like the first guy ever, <laughs> especially when I was doing recreational soccer and even club soccer sometimes out of the blue, kids don't show up. You know, so what do you expect upon practice attendance? So if it's a deal where your association, like we used to have in Midland, would be, you know, if a kid didn't show up to, to all the practice that week, you could document it, turn it into the, the director of the age group, and then they could be not, not be held up to play half the game, but they only got 25% of the game. Well, if that's something that happens is from the very beginning to set it up. The next thing I'll tell you is arrival and pickup time. If you're running an a organized practice, which I'm hoping that will help you get there, but as far as an organized practice, it's critical that in the very first part of the practice, they're there on time, started, ready to go. Because if uh, little Jimmy shows up halfway through practice, they're going to miss the intro part of the, the part that they had to have technically that's going to develop them through the practice. And I hate to say this, but you got to say, look, it's important for you guys to be here on time. The next thing is, and us might be pull up people, but bet we can open up four stories of pickup. You would think that most parents care about their kids enough that when the practice is over, they show up. But I will tell you, when I was coaching high school, you know, we come back in from a trip in, out in West Texas at midnight, and then we're now calling the parent. And I'm talking to the parent saying, you got to come get your kid, and it's 1 o'clock in the morning. I mean, some crazy things used to use happen. Heather, go ahead. What do you got, Heather? Yes, thank you. Um, so I do have a question. My husband and I are kind of like you mentioned earlier, being thrown into coaching um, or my son wouldn't have a team. We were going to have two kids on um, the boys, six and seven year old. Okay. Um, we both played soccer in the past, but I haven't played since grammar and he hasn't played since high school. Um, okay. So first time coaching. Now with this um, practice attendance, when does it start really getting serious at what age? Cause I, I don't, I don't know what expectation to have going into coaching such young kids. Like is the expectation now to start cutting them down to 25% play if they're not coming to practice all week, or is that not starting for a couple more years until they're older and have more of a say how to get to practice and all that good stuff? Got it. Let me back up one thing to make sure uh, I make it clear because I may have messed this up. Not every single association has that 25% thing. It's only right. going to be limited by your local association. The first thing is to reach out and hopefully in their first meeting that they have, they'll address that issue. To me, I would always think if, if, if I'm donating my time to be out there and maybe because I was an old coach, I kind of expect the, the kids to be there. Right. But you know what? On, on the other side of the coin is, and part of the communication piece, I need to go back in and update my deal. You know, it's probably not a bad idea to have the parents come together and agree on days they can meet. Now, not everybody's going to be happy, but if you know little Sally has, has dance on this night, but all the other parents could be there, you know, maybe that's something you've got to work out, you know, especially through the younger age groups and even up to the higher age groups, there's times when things had to, to be adjusted. 
So to be the yeah. hardcore, you're here, you know what? I don't know if that's always the best idea. But, you know, that being said, if you let the parents have a say in, in what the schedule is going to be and not everybody's going to be happy, that may also help out with that as well. Okay, so kind of take a poll in the first meeting of what days would work yes. best for everyone. Okay. And always found that to work out for me. At the end of the day, you've given your time because, like you said, if you didn't coach, they don't play. So right. I'm on the side of, hey, you know, I, I'm donating my time. Here's the times I can be here. But if you're flexible in your time, it might be a way to find the best thing because it may be that every single boy has, a, I don't know, t-ball that day or something, whatever they're, they're doing as well. And so it'll work out with that too. But I'd take the parents in and have them a part of that. That okay, that sounds good. All right, thank you. And just um, a little question. How okay. serious should I be as a coach with this age? Like, I think this is a good age where they're going to start really learning the game itself. Okay. But I also don't want to be too coachy, if that makes sense. Oh, beautiful. With this age group. You're awesome. I need you, Heather, because you can help me plug my coaching schools or my coaching clinics that we're going to start putting out. But I'll <laughs> tell you, what was the age group again? Six, seven. Six, seven. I will tell you what the greatest teacher of all is the game. And so the way we're, we're building our coaching clinics is to set up an environment where the kids come up with the ideas. You're going to develop an environment where they learn to, to play. And through their play, they're going to pick up their ideas. But that's a, a plug for the, the future. But yeah, I want to get you involved in it. And then in the Mojo app for the next webinar, he'll cover some of that stuff as well. Great. But yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. And, and feel free to reach out. And like I said, we've got some some coaches courses coming up that'll kind of lead you into that as well. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's just, it's it's scary, but it's fun. Right. <laughs> now, scary for sure. Yes, 100%. The next one is one that my wife had to help me with, the how to talk to their player. And especially as me being a coach, you know, I remember that being super coach guy, I'd get in and, and my daughter come off, she didn't play very well and it start ripping her to shreds. And I'm the coach, and, and we had a lot of conversations where my wife re reintroduced me to thinking right. But the, the part of the stuff I want you to understand is that if a kid comes in and they come to, to you after a game, for example, you want to make sure that the, the parent understands that they're really there to be the cheerleader. Let you be the bad guy. Let them learn. But really, when they get in the car, it's their job kind of to be the, the one that loves on them, that cares about them, that gets them there, you know. The best, worst thing we do for a kid to not want to play anymore, because my daughter doesn't play anymore, and I ran out of the game because I was that guy. But your job as a parent now is to just kind of be supportive, you know, talk about the game, what they have fun, what they think they did well, and try to keep as positive experience as possible. Because I know that anybody who's been around the game knows the exact opposite of seeing the parent that rips them to shreds once they get off the field. How much fun would that be? You know, how to talk to other players or parents. You know, it's sad to say. But anytime, right, you go on a field, you'll hear some dad pop off, you know, well, you'd have won if Billy had done this, or I can't believe that Susie did this, or the goalkeeper, why do they do this? You know, I always had, even at the high school level, I mean, obviously I could do when I was doing semi-pro, but the high school level, I said, look, here's the deal. You can talk to your kid, but you cannot talk to anybody else. You cannot be negative to other kids on the field. That's not going to help. Not only that, but it also builds a parent bond, because if you have mama bears like I've got in my family, the second you talk bad about their kid, now you've got issues. And it's sad to say, but this is a big thing that you got to get in. Next thing is coaching from sidelines. You know, everybody wants to be the perfect coach. And I want, actually, it's kind of a fun experiment. I did this one time. But a lot of times, the parents will repeat everything you said. So, for example, you say, hey, you know, push up. Then everybody scream, push up. I said, whatever. I said, do they repeat what you said? But the worst one is when they're across the sidelines from you. And they decide that they're going to give coaching points and so for example when I was coaching club you know I had a had a team and the ball was passed back to the goalkeeper and they were screaming at this kid to go chase the goal chase the ball chase the goalkeeper down but that's not the way we played we all go to the keeper we drop back get compact get our team organized let them come back at us and then we take and recover well by that parent screaming something totally different it took the team and spread them out more than what they should have and so it was exactly opposite what I was teaching the kids so after practice, I had to go up and, you know, explain, here's, here's why we're doing it. Please don't do that anymore because you just hurt our team and hurt what we're trying to change. A lot of times these people don't know what you're training or how you're doing it, but it's how we do it from the sidelines. What I say usually is that here's what, what the best thing you do. Yay, go, rah, you know, oh, awesome, Billy, and be as positive as loud as you can. 
and try to make it as fun environment for the kids as possible. Next thing is when we've got a problem, and actually it's kind of sad that, that we're gonna bring this up, but how many of all, and kind of by a show of hands, I can see everybody on the screen, how many of y'all been around when the, the parents talk about somebody else's team player? Oh, little Billy, not that girl's a pusher. You know what I'm talking about? Knocked her over, which really doesn't always happen. But there's something that's been arising, and especially it's kind of scary in, in youth sports. And it was brought up at the, the high school coaches convention for all sports. And it's also brought up in our, our AGM meeting with North Texas. We're having a rise on parents on the sidelines, getting in fights with other parents for issues, just like this. But it all starts usually about one person screaming out something about somebody else's kid. And now we've got a bench clearing ball with both sets of parents. And so that's something that as a coach, that's kind of your team. And so we got to find a way to get them to understand that that's not appropriate. You cannot scream out about somebody else's kid, no matter how bad you think it is. Let the referee take care of it. Let the coach take care of it. But it's not really your place to yell at somebody else's kid or on another team. That's not going to help out. And hopefully it'll head off some of these issues. The next thing is talking to the referees, right? I hate to tell you this, our next biggest problem besides the, the fighting fact, probably bigger than the, the fighting parents, is the low number of referees. There's a reason for our referee numbers dropping. And one of the major reasons is, is that the way we treat these people, you know, the saddest thing is, is if, when I was coaching, you know, you go out to a field and there'd be a little 12-year-old referee that's learned how to do it on a four-year-old soccer game. Well, these referees or these adults start screaming at this poor 12-year-old. You know, you're taught from a young age that, to treat adults with respect. But it's hard to come back in and be respectful when you've got some 35-year-old or 28-year-old who you're supposed to respect screaming at you about the game. We have a huge drop-off from the first time to when they go in, so we've got to really do a better job of, of treating these referees correctly. Because I don't think there's any 12-year-old or even any referee that goes out to honestly cheat anybody. Obviously, humans make mistakes. You're going to make it as a coach. We make it as players. But we've got to do a better job of treating these guys right. And the last thing was kind of, kind of weird, but it's true. For those of y'all coached, the second somebody gets hurt on the field, what does mama usually like to do? Come, yeah, that's it. Mario's hand said perfect. They come screaming on the field. The problem with this is this, if you've ever been around that, you know, little Susie falls over, gets bunk on the knee. She's okay. Everything's fine until mom comes, hey, okay, okay. Well, instantly, the, the bump on the knee or the bruise turns into an ACL injury right there just by the reaction of the kid. Because what happens with mom, she comes in her dad, and they get excited. That scares the kid. And so the kid starts to think it's worse instead of, hey, you know, oh, you're all right. Let's go. Let's pick it up and let's play. You know, find a way to say, look, if they're injured, give us a second. Let us work it out. Let's try to sort it out. And then now we'll get it. If it's an emergency, we'll take care of it different. But most of the time, that's just somebody fell over. And please try to stay on the sidelines. Let us work it out and try to get it. If it's bad, then we'll get you there too. That sometimes will help out. Any other parent expectations that I've not covered? And I'll pause for a second to, to bring in what you got. Mario, did you have something? Uh, yeah. Um, so I think those are very good points. And uh, for the new coaches, because I had to deal with this when I started, you know, my son, I think when he was six years old, I think you have to make very clear um, to the parents, like their limits before the game and after the game. Like, for example, um, probably three or four years ago, at some point, I had these two parents that every halftime, they would like to come around the field, go to the bench talk to their kid and kind of give them directions or coaching on what they were supposed to do. And then, so I had to have a meeting and stop that completely. You know, I was very clear. I say, well, before the game, during the game, um, I'm the coach. I'm the one that gives the directions. I'm the one donating my time and studying the, the game and do all my coaching classes and all that. So let me run the team. You know, you can yell and support all you want from the, from your sideline, but uh, during the game, uh, I'm the one running the team. So I think uh, putting those limits on your expectations from the very beginning is going to it's going to help you uh, coach better or having less problems. If you want to say with your parents uh, during the game, that that helped me tremendously. Well said, Mario. I, I probably need to add that to the list. But yeah, that's a crazy thing they'll do. They'll come up during halftime and decide to give their input. I love it. Brent, did you have something? Look like you're about to say something. 
Yeah, all very good points. Um, the, and, and, and every parent is is different. So how you begin communicating everything up front is, is very important. But as you address those things during the season, um, each parent react differently. Some are very compliant. They're like, oh, yeah, sorry about that. And, and some are, are much more aggressive and, 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 and treated as a confrontation as opposed to. So how you treat parents that are that are um, maybe complaining about another child uh, or talking about the other team or talking to the ref. There are there are certain ways that you you have to kind of read your read the room with the parents. Um, but also the there's kind of a level of where where I always have seen how you address certain situations. Do I address it now? Do I address it after the game? Do I address it at a call after they've had time to go home and, and, and calm down? Um, but uh, dealing with a, one of your parents that's 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 talking to the referee needs to be stopped. And 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 how you how you and when you approach that parent and how you do that so that it's not um, embarrassing to the parent or it doesn't bring them, you know, you're not parading them in front of anything, but also that when the other parents are doing something that's really impacting the game as a whole and having that conversation with the other coach who may not have the same philosophy as you, um, but, but has to still be addressed. So uh, as a coach, you, you really need to, to make sure you're, you're pretty, um, you're on top of addressing whatever that situation is and, and at the correct point in time. That's kind of the way the way I've addressed any issues with my own parents or parents from the uh, of the other team. No, well, I like it, Brent. And I think you bring up a couple of points that you know I wish I'd I'd taken care of as well. But one thing I want you to, to kind of think about too in that same deal, if it's something that that can be talked about afterwards. It is best to go over and say, hey, look, can I talk to you after? If you're calm. Now, if I'm all fired up and I'm all anxious and my face is red and I'm angry, that's not going to help anything. So maybe I, as a coach, have to follow the 24-hour rule. But if you have a calm disposition to say, hey, look, you know, how would you feel if you're the other person's parent? How would you feel if this happened to you? And use those how questions. You know, what if you were that the parent of that referee? How would you have felt at the end of that? about your actions? Because most people are, are good and they'll understand to answer the questions. I do have another cool way that when I was at Midland High, we had a, a major issue with yelling at referees. Now, part of the problem I'll tell you was me. I was the example of what not to do. But at the same time, I started seeing the calls going against my team at Midland High. And so what I did is I took our, our uh, team mom at the time and gave her a box of blow pops that I bought at uh, like Sam's. And I said, okay, anytime somebody starts yelling at the referee, don't say anything, just give them a blow pop. And so that was kind of a sign to the team to shut your mouth because that's in, it's kind of a funny way of doing it. But it came a joke at the beginning, but then after a while they started getting it because every time she'd give somebody a blow pop, it got them back in line. So that might be a way to, a funny way of doing it too, of coaching the sidelines. It might be a way of, you know, check in, the, um, talking about about other kids, people or parents, just a nice way, of, just friendly way of reminder saying, hey, stick this in your mouth because you're not doing right. And so thank you, Brent. I'm glad I almost left that part out, but that's an excellent point. Anything else anybody wants to bring up? Okay, so we'll go on to the next thing. That's kind of a cool way. I'm yep, sorry. go ahead. No, you're fine. No, you know, I just I, I just had a thought as I was thinking through a lot of this stuff as a parent. Is, is it appropriate? Because um, a lot of these sound like non-negotiable stuff, right? Like, so do, do you give the space for the parents to sit, I mean, I'm just trying to think through how do you present something that's negotiable as opposed to non-negotiable. So, um, or do you even give that expectation? So what would you consider? Now that's gonna be up to you as a, as a coach, how you want the team to go. So what do you figure or feel like the negotiable things are? What do you feel like the non-negotiables? Now we'll tell you this, that if, if you bring up in one of these little meetings, and this may be not answering your question, I hope it is, but let's say, for example, no yell at the referee. If you said in the meeting, but then the first time it happens, nothing's done, you've lost it. Yeah. Right? The first time somebody yells at another parent or yells at somebody else's kid, you don't address it, you've lost it. And from then on out, it's, it's between saying and doing. Because all of y'all had teachers that walked in that first day and said, you know, this is the way it's going to be. It's my classroom. You do it. And then 
the end of the year is a Harry Carey, right? Yeah. Because there was not the expect, set expectations, but follow up. So what do you feel like would be non-negotiable or what's negotiable for you? You know, and just so I'm just asking a question. What do you think? Which parts of that might be negotiable or what things might be there? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm still new at this, but, you know, just from a perspective from playing, I, you know, I love everything that's been in that list before. I mean, those right. things are non-negotiable and, and then enforcing that, right? But I, I'm trying to just kind of be an advocate. Like, do you give us a, a space for parents to to kind of speak their mind if you just tell them? You know, you just kind of thinking through. Oh, yeah. um, oh no, for sure. Yes. And it, well, you know, I'm trying to think back when I coached. Well, I was really big on a leadership council, but same thing. The players had an idea. I wanted her to bring it to me. So if mom comes up, you know, it comes back to ego on the shelf. You now certain things that we're not going to talk about, you know, probably should have put this on the list too. Now we're talking, but one of those would be, you know, we don't talk about anybody else's kids. So when you're going to come talk to me, that's non-negotiable. I'm not talking about Sally. I'm talking about your child, you yeah. know, cause there's nothing we're going to do about it. So that's one of the non-negotiables, but it may be a thing to say, okay, why isn't Billy come? Why isn't Billy playing? You know, and you got to put your ego on the shelf, listen to them, because at the end of the day, they care about their kids. They love their kids, you know, and they'll say the little piece and, and try not to get upset and say, OK, well, here's why. Here's what I think we can improve. Here's how we can do better. But a lot of it has to do with how you react and stay in that calm, you know, understanding the people you're talking to aren't your enemy, but actually love their kid. You know, that's something I guess from my early days of coaching when I didn't have kids, I didn't understand. But now that I've had children, I understand now that, you know, it hurts when little Billy doesn't get to play as much as the other kids, right. you know, they're naturally going to be upset and try to see it through that lens. Whenever you talk to them to say, no, I get what you're saying, but here's blah, blah, blah. Why he's not playing. I'd be able to answer those questions in a calm demeanor. If that makes sense. Cause you want them to talk to you because I'll promise you this one thing. If they don't talk to you, they're going to talk to the other ones and they'll start building their own little group of, uh, you know, anti Saul, you know, anti coach people. And that's going to be a bigger issue. So part of the communication, we go back in and say, look, you know, I want you to come. If you have a problem, bring it to me right away. It's so much easier if we deal with it right now on the very beginning. than if four weeks later, you're still upset. And now you got the whole team in a, you know, in a ruckus trying to come after the coaches, if that makes sense. And so I think a lot of it probably needs to put into this thing, you know, say, look, let's deal with it in the beginning. Parent out of control. Deal with it in the beginning. Parent talking about a deal right off the bat and start nipping the bud from the beginning, but stay consistent throughout time. Yeah. You know, yeah. so hey, you guys are awesome because you're thinking, dang, all the things I've already left out of the PowerPoint. And, I appreciate and Warren, it. Warren, you mentioned something early on that really plays into that is you said the parents are also trying to figure this out too. And so 100%. as a coach, um, I, I think not only looking at it as your, it's your time to, you're teaching skills and basics and, and just understanding soccer to the, to, especially the younger years, um, you're teaching those 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 players. You're also look at yourself as a coach that's teaching parents how to be better parents on the sidelines, um, and that you know non negotiable can addressing things, but it doesn't have to be like one strike you're out. But it, it right. um, but definitely how do I approach this so that they're learning that that's not appropriate, no matter what you've seen on TV and a uh, hundred videos of parents getting in scuffles. So well said, Brent. So how does that answer it? It does. Thank, thanks, Warren. Appreciate it. No, no problem. Now I'm going to give you a little ammo. So on that very first practice, you know, what they never understand is really what the parents say or what the kids really believe, right? Everybody has an idea of what their child believes when they go into it. So usually on that first day, we start with the practice with the kids. You know, we, we talk about, and we're going to bring this up with parents, but, you know, how do you dress? How many of y'all, and I don't know if this happens much anymore, but have the kids show up in jeans and tennis shoes at practice with no ball, no water. You know, they just come straight out and they jump on the field and play. Well, that's not appropriate. You got to have shin guards for your safety as well as the, the child's safety. You know, what do they need to wear if it's cold outside? Bring a jacket for crying out loud. You know, just appropriately have to have water, especially with today. Now, here's the part you're going to ask the kids. And this is wild because this is also going to give you ammunition to hold the kids accountable and also your parents. But I always ask them, you know, what does a good teammate look like? And let them answer the question. Let these little guys come in and write them all down because you're going to use this for the parents in a minute. So what does a good teammate look like? You know, how would you address it? And so the kids will come up with everybody knows 
what a good teammate looks like, you know, and how it gets directed in. Let's write it down. What a successful player look like. So within the game, they might not know. Maybe it's the the kick or pass maybe the first time. But most will say stuff like work hard, score goals, something. Then you write that down. Okay, that's what a successful player looks like. How should the players talk to each other? Now, everybody's probably been a part of a team where you've got that one little jerk in the in the team, right? This bad mouse, everybody else that talks bad. Well, from the very beginning, you say, okay, well, what would what a good teammate look like? How should we talk to each other when it's bad or good? You know, what should it be? You know, and they'll all say their answers. We're going to write all these things down. You know, discipline. You know, what are we going to do if, if somebody messes up? What would you guys think is appropriate? And how are we going to handle it? Now, this is going to go more to the parents say, okay, well, you know, if I've got to talk to your kid three times, I'm going to sit him on the side and let him sit for a while and think, and then I'm going to bring him to you and sort it out. You know, and then we also list in the never confront referees. You never, ever, if you're going to talk to referee, let me deal with it now. If you're going to say, good job, ref, it's okay to talk to these people, not to be afraid of them, but we're never, ever going to argue with those people. And if you do, you're going to come sit with me right away. And we take care of that part. The part that I didn't ask or put it in the slide, I'm looking back on it is ask them why they play soccer. What do they think fun looks like? And write that down. Because when you ask the parents in that parent meeting, going back to that first slide, say, well, you said here's why, they're, why they play, but here's what they said. You know, one thing, just thinking back through it, is what do you want out of your parents? You know, what does a good parent look like? Once again, looking at these slides, I think, crud, I left this off. But I've actually done that with high school and had the parent had the players read to the parents before season what their expectations of the parents were. And it'll blow your mind how effective that was because then the parents are going, oh my God. Because most of us said, don't talk, talk, you know, say mean things to me after the game, don't coach from the sidelines, all the things that I've always told them. The kids now are the ones that came up with their own rules, said their own thing, and then they they gave it to the parents right then and explained it to them. You know, and it's it's eye-opening for them. But using those things and have the kids, okay. What do you expect out of your parents? And then report it back to the, the parents and say, well, here's what your parent, here's what your kids think. Especially at a team three or four times, it becomes unbelievably effective as you start progressing this thing on. Any other expectations you guys can think of? All right, keep pushing on because I know I want to keep it to, to one hour. The last thing is, is that like poor Heather who got stuck being the one that has to cope, right? They don't play. Well, you stepped up. But now this is the second part of the scene. You're not expected to do everything. And please don't, don't let that happen. The next part is say, okay, hey, I need somebody to be the manager. I need somebody to help me out. I need somebody that's going to take care of the app and assign people in the group. Who's going to assign the post-game snacks or drinks? You don't do that as a coach. To me, it was always find somebody willing to take care of that, that, that organize that kind of stuff. You know, if it comes down to ride sharing, if there's emergency, and this may be going, actually some of this key to it, what's going to happen? Who's going to be in charge of calling if something happens? You know, how are we going to work together to make sure everything's sorted out? There's lightning. Where are we going to go? What's going to happen? And anything else you might need help with. And so any other things you guys can see that we'd add to this list? The key point to me is this. Get these people to help you. They want to be a part of the team. They're not somebody who should be pushed off, but somebody should be incorporated. And the more they feel like they're a part, the more they're going to be on your team. If we set up the wall between us and them, I guarantee that wall will go against you. But if you incorporate them into some of these things that, that are important to your team, that's sure going to help out. And the last and most important thing is have a good time. You know, enjoy this thing, because I'll tell you what, after, gosh, it was 28 years of, of public education plus five years of, of club soccer when I was in college. And I've enjoyed every day. And the reason I'm doing this job right now is because I enjoyed it so much. You know, and there was never a day I went to work. And that should be the same thing with you. If you go in, right attitude started from the very beginning, I promise you're going to have a good time. And I want you to enjoy what you've got. So with that, I'm going to open up to any questions you guys might have or any thoughts as we start to close out. And then I'll, I'll get some different information about future uh, webinars and we'll go from there. All right, there's no questions. I've got these and I'll, what I'll do is I'll have this webinar posted on the website, but I'll also post in the, the notes. So you actually can take this PowerPoint. It'll be linked in, in our uh, website on the, on the North Texas website. 
and you can click on any one of these things. But this is some of the, the place I got some of the ideas for today. They'll have some things I talked about, plus some other information and a different spiel to it. But I'll make sure I give you guys enough information on everything we have to help you out. Now, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and close it up here. And in fact, you know, I'm going to leave it open. And there's a reason why. Hey, the purpose of the webinars was one thing when I got this job, you know, I'm trying to find a way to, to help our coaches out. You know, part of my love in doing this job was the fact that I get to finally help others that, to do it and hopefully enjoy it as much as I have. So I'm trying to get these things in a biweekly manner. If we have interest, I can go weekly. But it's not only going to be just for the, the lower level coaches. I'm going to bring in some top educators and top coaches from around the country. And so it'll be different varying levels of, of complexity to help all coaches that we possibly have. For the first three, though, I'm really gearing towards the brand new coach to help them out. I need you to go ahead too. It's going to be made for you, right? Please fill out the future webinar request that I send in the link. If there's something that you're interested in knowing, I know a lot of people put practices. And so I'm trying to figure out a way that I can start generating those for you. And then what we got to do, the future clinics is going to be on the, whoops, on the seventh, we're going to have Tom Arnett with Mojo Soccer. And especially for our brand new coaches out there, it's going to set up within this application. They've got free practices for coaches. And so what will happen with that is that you'll walk out and you'll look at it. It's based on the U.S. soccer uh, education model that will be from the beginning of practice to end, and it's free to you as a coach. Now, the where they make money is if you start setting up different things or including practices for parents. That's how he makes his money. He's going to go over how to use the app and the things to use next time. One thing I'm really excited about is on August 21st, we got Chelsea Dunleavy. Now, Chelsea is, is an unbelievable teacher. Teacher, She's a high-level player from back in college. But she's also the education specialist for the Northwest ISD. And she asked what practice run. I said, really, I don't really want to practice. I want how to teach kids that are elementary age kids. You know, not so much a, an X's and O's practice, but how to deal with that little guy, that little turkey in the class that doesn't act right. How do we engage him? And I'll give you an example where I thought this was special. Whenever I was doing, the, uh, in, back in Midland, we had a special We or once a week we did a camp for kids in the Midland Soccer Association. Well, Chelsea had a set of so four-year-olds and they were all talking, talking, talking. And she said, bubbles in the mouth. And every single kid put their lips together, blew up their cheeks and made them were quiet. And I thought, holy cow, what just happened? But she'll bring in the techniques that all the elementary teachers are using right now to teach kids and provide information for, especially for that, any coach from, like I said, from four years old to 10 years old, things that in the education world to do. And, and I'm really excited about that one. We're also going to have a YouTube channel where you can click in and get these webinars if you can't make it at noon on Mondays, but we'll figure out from there. And with that being said, are there any questions you guys have or any thoughts for future future webinars? Um, if I can speak real quick, so I got to go back to work. Uh, gotcha. Uh, first, I want to thank you for doing this. This is this is great. Uh, even though, you know, especially for the first time coaches, but uh, you something that has worked for me. Uh, very well and this is for the new coaches just go ahead and involve your parents as much as you can um, and when I say that I mean I don't know help you with the cones um, you know if you the end of the practice you do a scrimmage and you need a goalie use your parents as goalies if if you need to I have used I have used that technique for many years and you know they like that and the kids like that you involve some parents into into the team and practices uh, something that has worked very, very well for me uh, throughout the years with the team, the parents and the boys is do activities outside, just the soccer practice, you know, twice a week or whatever, you know, pool parties, trampoline park, go to FC Dallas game, uh, go watch these other kids play, birthday parties, anything like that. That has helped me tremendously. I think one is the key that I have kept my kids since from recreation, also they were six and seven, most of them until right now that we club and we play in a select level now they're 12 so um, i think this has been the key and i have found a very strong um, group of parents so doing all these mm -hmm. extra activities that will definitely help you guys uh, for the future it's worked for me so i just want to share that so you guys can go ahead and use it um and i gotta go but thank you, thank you very much i will see you in two weeks yeah that would definitely help well said, go ahead and use it yeah that's well said thank good point Thank you. Anybody else? All right. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and close off the, 
the recording.